Welcome to the Concordia Gallery. I hope some of you have been in this room before uh, for our ongoing series of exhibits over there. This one intrigues me because I think that some of this artwork I probably saw on the calendars or books that my father shouldn't have been reading. <laughs> when, I, when I was young, I don't know, B movie stuff in the 50s and 60s. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you today and also to introduce uh, Professor Sardar Ara, uh, Professor of Art and Director of the Gallery. Uh, for this lecture, Sudar gave this lecture two weeks ago, uh, a Tuesday, Tuesday evening, two weeks ago, um, and I was thrilled. I was just telling some other friends, uh, 1937 is not a year that rings true in my in my mind necessarily. I, I hear it was a heck of a year. Uh, <laughs> just, I just can't tell you that personally. I did a little research that uh, 1937 was quite a year. The uh, Duke of Windsor, uh, recently, who had recently been King of England, married Mrs. Simpson. Uh, President Roosevelt uh, pushed through a number of Supreme Court nominations to stack the deck, as it were, to stock the court, in order to ensure that his and a number of those social programs that he instituted in the New Deal would be justified uh, or declared constitutional. The Spanish Civil War took, took root to great height in both the United States, England, and France, uh, put an embargo on dealing with Spain. All of these events, maybe not the Windsor. Uh, but that certainly rocked certain uh, portions of society, had an impact on 1937, both its politics and ultimately its art, and that's what the lecture will do this morning. I want to introduce Professor Sirdar Arad, who's been with us now for three years, and we're delighted that he is. And I do the lights. Yes, please. Already? Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Good morning. And uh, welcome to Concordia Gallery and also to the year of 1937. Great job, Kevin. I did that well, huh? <laughs> <laughs> two times, two times. In one word, uh, this morning's talk, I think, is about power. Uh, perhaps because I'm an artist, a painter myself, I tend to put my faith in the power of images, in the power of art. Uh, however, I do that with the understanding that uh, art probably is the only arena where as human beings we can be totally honest, totally truthful, and uh, explore who we are and what it's like to be alive. Political leaders and ideologues, on the other hand, are also interested in the power of images, power of art, as you can see here, but their interest in art in the power of art is based on the notion that they can actually use it for their own rather single-minded purposes. So I'm talking about propaganda versus art. On the face of it, as uh, the moment we look at these two slides, uh, we can see, we can recognize them as propaganda. And what we're really looking at is the, uh, the image in either one of these paintings. So the, the picture, the image, tells us very quickly, very easily, that this is propaganda. My focus, however, this morning will be on um, something deeper, the visual language of art. In other words, what is what, what we call the style of an artist, whether it's impressionistic, expressionistic, surrealistic, realistic, whatever it might be. Uh, my, my point has always been that uh, propaganda can be easily detected on the face of a work of art, but what happens when it seeps into the deeper visual language of art? So that if we take out the swastika and put in, let's say, the American flag in there, stripes and stars, would it still be propaganda? Or would it be uh, easier for us to accept it, to buy it as good art? That will be the focus of my presentation. Um, uh, these two paintings, why 1937? I think that uh, the question to that, uh, the answer to that question will, will hopefully be clear by the end of this talk. Uh, this one is from 1937. It's called Stalin, as you might uh, recognize him, and Voroshilov, his field marshal, in the Kremlin after the rain. It's oil on canvas. The artist is Alexander Gerasimov. The second one is a, uh, or was, a fresco, an original fresco, on the wall of the train station in Braunschweig. Uh, the train station blew up during the bombings, uh, during air raids, uh, and so did the painting. 
This one is from 1930, and the artist is Beatrice Fassel. Stalin, by uh, 1937, was extremely successful in the Soviet Union in establishing a, a, an almost a cult around his image, his personality. And as you can see in this painting very clearly, he projected himself as this fatherly figure. Here he is the, the father of a nation. Uh, in that role, he is the protector, he is the provider, and he is the, truly the proud father overlooking Moscow. Uh, Hitler, likewise, established the same uh, propaganda machine in Germany by the year 1937, and here is uh, one uh, simple example. But what really got me going on the idea of this talk, of this lecture, were uh, these two photographs. When I saw these two photographs, uh, I knew I had to do something with them. I, I think these are incredible photographs. This is the year 1937. So the first major event that concerns uh, us uh, of, of 1937 is the opening of the International Expo, or the World Fair, in Paris in uh, July 1937. In the shadow of the Eiffel Tower, we have here two of the most bombastic proclamations of political ideology and art. On, the, on one side, we had the Soviet pavilion, the building and the tower that's topped with uh, a humongous sculpture. Right up against that, we have Hitler's, uh, Albert Speer, Hitler's uh, favorite architect, his building and tower. This is the German pavilion topped with the eagle that's holding the shield of the Third Reich and the uh, swastika. Uh, this is a better shot of, of um, that confrontation. And first, I will uh, zero in on the uh, Soviet pavilion. Uh, this one idealizes the Soviet worker and the farmer. We have uh, some close-ups. It's steel. You can see from the, the seams. It's uh, fabricated, welded steel. The original is or was an 80-inch tall bronze cast uh, sculpture. The artist is Vera Mukina, a female artist, and Boris Evanov is the architect who designed the building tower. Uh, much like Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel painting, uh, God Creating Adam, where the two hands are touching, uh, in the same way that image became the creative symbol for Western art, uh, this sculpture became the creative symbol for uh, Soviet uh, for the Soviet Union, for Soviet uh, political revolution. We have the uh, heavy industry worker the, uh, worker, the male figure, and the collective farmer, the female figure. Against that, we have Spears Tower. Spear did, uh, did uh, some fancy spy work, and he got early notice of how tall and how big the Soviet pavilion was about to be, so he secretly worked out his plans to slightly surpass the Soviets. I mean, this, this is like the Cold War confrontation between the US and the USSR almost happening uh, in this World Fair. So his tower uh, is slightly more than 100 feet as opposed to roughly 80 feet Soviet tower. I think uh, this is a nice contrast, the uh, uh, architectural and artistic style of Third Reich comes across as more foreboding more authoritarian. Uh, the individual, or simply the inclusion of figure, of the human figure in the artwork, at least in this case, is um, excluded. It really is, is an ominous piece with our knowledge of history. This is a daytime shot of that building. In another part of the same fairground, and this is, again, uh, why I was interested in this, this topic. Picasso's Guernica was exhibited for the first time. This is the Spanish pavilion of the Spanish government in exile. As Kevin pointed out, the uh, civil war was going on. It was raging in uh, Spain. And Hitler's Luftwaffe, his air force, actually bombed the Spanish town of Guernica, as you all know, uh, in 1937. Picasso was commissioned to paint a mural for the Spanish pavilion. As he was searching for subject matter, the news of the bombing of this massacre of the innocent, almost a biblical theme for him, came through. And he made that 
his topic, his subject. In front of Guernica, however, you may recognize an American sculptor, Alexander Calder, which is interesting. You probably know him by his mobiles, hanging steel mobiles, uh, and some freestanding steel pieces. So uh, Picasso's Guernica is a painting that we will come back to later on. Uh, Another footnote, 1937 also witnessed the unveiling of the model of the Museum of Modern Art Building in Manhattan. Uh, one of the first examples, maybe the first example of modern art in, in, in the United States, in, uh, uh, in New York certainly, of modern architecture. We will also revisit the architectural style here. This building became the, uh, the chapel, if you will, for modern artworks like Picasso's Guernica. In fact, Guernica, as you know, ended up in the Museum of Modern Art for many years. It was given back to Spain only after Franco's, General Franco's death, as Picasso wished or willed it. The three gentlemen you may, uh, you may recognize, Nelson Rockefeller, um, Conger Goodyear, and Steve Clark. As I said, we will, we will definitely come back to it. Now, I'm keeping this slide up here simply for this interesting uh, contrast. This is a Hitler rally in Berlin uh, in the summer of 1936. Order, uncompromising social order. And we are going to see, I believe, uh, that uncompromising social order seeping into the artistic style in, uh, for the, uh, the uh, Third Reich. The kind of order that has to exist for, for any society, for any artwork. As chaotic as uh, Picasso's Guernica might seem, there is an incredible struggle for compositional structure, for order. However, these are two different kinds of establishing order. On one side, we see order established at the expense of the individual. Uh, the individuals in this rally are really no different than the flags, or the columns that we see, sort of like mere ornaments. Picasso's Guernica displays a chaotic energy. It almost seems as if the energy uh, in this painting is, is out of control. It's, it's, it looks like total chaos. Uh, at least, the least we can say is that it acknowledges dynamism, it acknowledges change. And uh, uh, a society that is likely to change a dynamic society is the last thing that an authoritarian state uh, would like to have, in fact. Um, here is one of the examples of the art of the Third Reich. This is a war monument that opened up in 1936, close enough to 37, in Hamburg. Um, it is right across from the uh, botanical gardens in, in the city of Hamburg, if, if you've been there, if you know the city. And uh, for decades now, this piece ha withdrew uh, criticism. There's graffiti. Uh, there are constant attacks on this sculpture because many of the residents of Hamburg feel that this sculpture, this monument, has fascist overtones. Uh, I believe it goes beyond mere overtones. Now, on the surface, it's a militaristic theme. Uh, it's the Army of the Third Reich marching endlessly around this humongous uh, limestone uh, mass. So uh, there are fascist overtones in terms of the subject matter, in terms of the picture. However, I think it's important for us to look at the style. In other words, not just what is being pictured, but how it is being pictured. How these individuals, if they are individuals, in fact, are being portrayed. If you look at those sharp angular lines with which not only the barrels of the guns are, are uh, described, but also anatomy, human anatomy is described. Uh, there is, again, the kind of mold, the kind of order that seems unbreakable uh, in this sculpture. So I will, as, as much as I can, I will try to uh, bring us to uh, the style, the visual language. Here are a few other examples. Militarism is one of the aspects of the art of the Third Reich. Uh, here's a painting called SS on Guard. It's from 1934. Ferdinand Steger is the uh, name of the artist. Uh, it's an oil on canvas. And here's another painting of the Third Reich, Werner 
Piner. This is a drawing made for a cycle of tapestries. Uh, it's called Frederick the Great at Kunersdorf. So it's a great German victory, great German uh, war painting. I would like to keep this one up for a while and show you one of the most favorite, maybe the most uh, favorite painting of, of Hitler's and also of Napoleon, by the way, and mine. I don't know what that says. But uh, <laughs> this is a painting from uh, 1529. Uh, Altdorfer, Albrecht Altdorfer, a German artist. This is tempera and oil on wood. It's five feet by four feet. It's one of the most famous war paintings of all time. Uh, Hitler, because he's, uh, because Altdorfer is a ger great German artist, and this is a, a wonderful painting, really, uh, spoke a lot and wrote a, a lot about this painting and, uh, and, and his, uh, the artist's style. And then, uh, allegedly, Napoleon abducted this painting during one of his conquests and hung it across from his wooden bathtub, contemplating his, uh, his own military victories, looking at this painting. And in fact, this is the, the kind of painting that you probably would like to show to your troops before they go off to the front. It is a magnificent painting. It's, it's the, uh, the war, the ancient war between Alexander the Great and King Darius of Persia that took place 333 BC. Now, this is an ancient battle. However, Altdorfer takes that, that ancient battle and places it in 16th century Germany. That's why you, you see Gothic cathedrals and castles in the background. Uh, the armors and the, and the accessories, the weapons, everything that the armies are using and wearing are also from 16th uh, century or of 16th century. This is the decisive moment of the, of the battle. The sun is rising, it's the daybreak, the moon, the crescent moon is on, retre uh, on retreat. Uh, Alexander Great's armies are, are about to be victorious. Darius's chariot has turned around and he is in fact leaving the battleground. You can see better probably here, Alexander on horseback, King Darius on his chariot. But this is an incredible uh, detail. There are literally thousands and thousands of soldiers and, uh, and, and weapons and armors and, and horses that are painted painstakingly. Uh, coming back to the painting itself, one third of it is devoted to the battle this incredible chaotic energy, the, the turbulence of the battle. Another third from about here, let's say, to the horizon line over the water and, and the mountains in the background. This is about the horizon line. Devoted to the landscape, the water, etc. Another third to the sky. So whatever uh, dynamic, chaotic event is taking place down below is also taking place in the landscape with the colors and the, uh, and the modeling and so forth, and uh, likewise in the sky. This is, in fact, like a, a starry night sky from, from Van Gogh uh, paintings, uh, more realistically, photorealistically -realist painted. The inscriptions that's dangling down from, from heavens is simply giving information as to what is going on, who is who. This is uh, Dar King Darius and Alexander the Great, the year uh, 333 BC, etc. But it's a very heroic painting. It's a glorious painting. What is missing from this painting, of course, is the consequences of war. We do see a few uh, dead soldiers here and there under the hooves of uh, some of the horses, but we don't really see the effects, the consequences of war. Uh, the two paintings, then, are similar in the sense that they glorify the chaotic, dynamic energy of war, and they glorify heroic death for motherland. Speaking of the consequences of war, Otto Dix. Now, here is a, a German artist who was uh, avant-garde for his time. This is 1936. It's an oil on canvas. The painting is called Flanders. He made this image uh, as an homage to a, a, a novel on the First World War, written by a French writer, Henri Barbus, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. He was very much taken by the novel. And he himself was in the army, in the German army, in fact. Otto Dix uh, had a teaching position in the Dresden Art Academy, a very prestigious position. And it is 
because of these paintings that he first was fired from his, uh, his teaching position and then uh, his works were ridiculed. He himself was condemned as we will see further down the road. Uh, he remained in Germany for the rest of his life in um, internal exile, really. Another painting by him, this is a close-up. Here's the uh, painting itself. It's oil on canvas. It's called The Triumph of Death. This is from 1934. We're getting very close to uh, 1937. This is, I think, a good spot for us to eliminate one of the biases, the bias that all modern artists um, were progressive uh, in terms of their political ideologies, and that all those who went along with the art of the Third Reich or went along with the political ideology of the Third Reich were actually either um, reactionaries uh, or, to say the least, conservatives. And another bias that modernism really is uh, mostly about the uh, abstract formal experimentations in art. Here is a, an artist who is employing a realistic or let's say representational style, yet he's a modern artist because there is something else about his work that makes him modern. It is the fact that he is trying to expose something about life, in this case about war, rather than imposing um, an idea, an ideology, or uh, a, a moral uh, statement. Another common theme in the art of the Third Reich is the, the theme of the female nude. Uh, this is not new. This is not particular to the art of the Third Reich. It has been one of the favorite subjects of Western art for, for centuries. However, uh, what happens with the art, with the nudes, female nudes of the Third Reich, is that they, they quickly turn into formula paintings. For the Italian Renaissance artist, for instance, the female nude was simply an excuse to, to bring about some breakthroughs, some visual inventions. So one nude after another would, uh, would open a new door, would introduce some, some visual breakthroughs. Here we have formulas. This is the Führer building in Munich, designed by Gerdi Troost, another favorite architect of, uh, of Hitler. And uh, we have a triptych called the Four Element. It's all oil on canvas. Uh, what is re symbolically represented here is fire, earth, water, and air. The mission of women is to be beautiful and to bring children into this world. I'm sure we all agree with that. Uh, this is a direct quote uh, from a novel written by Goebbels. The, uh, as we all know, the Minister of Propaganda and people's enlightenment. That's the full title, and if that's not an oxymoron, I don't know what is. Propaganda and people's enlightenment, but that truly was the, uh, was the title. And um, he wrote a novel, he wrote, I think, several novels, but in, in one of them, he uh, described the role of women in German society as, as such. And we, we have to see these paintings in the light of that quote and, and others, other uh, quotes and uh, beliefs that shape Third Reich ideology. Family is the third favorite subject in the art of the uh, fourth, the art of the Third Reich. Here are two paintings from 1936. Farm Family from Kallenberg is the name of this painting. It's oil on canvas. Uh, Adolf Weissel is the artist. This one is called the Art Magazine, <coughs> oil on canvas. And the artist here is Odo Wendel. Uh, this probably is a, is a good point to get rid of another bias, that all Third Reich artists, so-called state artists, were really second, third, uh, fourth-rate mediocre artists, and that all modernists were really superior, first-rate uh, artists. I don't think that's true. Here are two examples, I believe, uh, that clearly uh, speak of quality. These are very skillful paintings, and they are, not, they are not really shallow propaganda, at least as far as I can, I can read them. Uh, I'd like to show you on this side, uh, just for a moment, a close-up of the far left-hand side of the painting. 
I'll come back to that again. Uh, here we have who looks like an art student uh, looking along with his parents uh, at an art magazine where, where they see a reproduction of a drawing of a female nude. Uh, they seem to be rather apprehensive to say the least. In both of these paintings there is uh, it's a rather um, heavy uh, moralizing content. What is interesting, we're, we're going to contrast this family picture uh, in a while, I'll, I'll come back to it, with a Soviet family uh, from 1937. And differences will probably be clearer. But here, if you notice, none of the figures are uh, talking. None of them are really acknowledging uh, each other. Or, or they're not engaged in any kind of activity, speech. Um, it's an interesting painting. Uh, we can go on and on about analyzing the composition and the uh, relative placement of the figures, the rather hierarchical uh, structure within the family, him, the father of the family, being even uh, placed in a position higher than even the grandmother, and the mother on, on, in the foreground as the most submissive, probably, uh, figure. But there is a pseudo-religious a moral statement, a kind of order that exists in this painting, which is very, very typical of the uh, official art of the Third Reich. One quick uh, comment here. This is a family picture, yet it is also a metaphor, I think, for the larger family, for society. So they have to be seen, I, I suppose, in, in that respect as well. Here's that beautiful close-up again. And with that, we will go to uh, the art of the Soviet Union. Year 1937, two paintings. Both of them are oil on canvas. This one is called Collective Farmers Greeting the Tank, which, which is about to trample their garden to pieces. Uh, it's an oil on canvas from uh, 1937. This one is called The Commune of Factory Youth. You can recognize all of a sudden a more joyous optimism, a more uh, colorful, uh, energetic style at work. More impressionistic. This one looks almost like a, a second-rate Renoir. Uh, but they are very cheery. They're very optimistic. They're very uh, idealistic uh, pictures. Well, wrong button. I knew this was going to happen. But uh, this is a very, very famous painting. and. Um, it is called The Unforgettable Meeting. Stalin and the Politburo uh, members greeting the wives of heavy industry workers. Year 1937, oil painting. It's a huge, huge canvas. Earlier we mentioned uh, Stalin as a fatherly figure or as the father of a nation. And if that's true, then here we're meeting the extended family. It is a, a very cheery, very optimistic celebration. Behind which, of course, as we know today, uh, millions of millions of massacres were, were taking place, killings were, uh, persecutions were taking place. Um, the Soviet art, Soviet official propaganda art replaced what is known as the Russian and also Soviet avant-garde, which took place roughly between 1915 and 1932. That's the time period. And this exhibition in, in the Guggenheim Museum in New York in 1993 reconstructed the Russian avant-garde. Uh, the Russian uh, first and then Soviet avant-garde is or was one of the strongest forces in, in modernism. Uh, Kandinsky, as, as you're familiar with his work, I'm sure, is a Russian artist who also lived in Germany, who was also uh, uh, censored and his works were banned and ridiculed and so forth, um, was one of the main forces behind uh, this movement. And most of these artists, by the way, were uh, quote unquote communists. They have embraced the communist revolution or the, uh, the, the Soviet political revolution when it came about. And they used their avant-garde and in most cases abstract experimentations in art in the style, the visual language of art, to celebrate uh, the Soviet Revolution. 
again, these are, uh, this is sort of the abstract version of the two paintings that we saw a minute ago. Uh, farmers greeting the tank and the communal factory youth. These are very optimistic, very idealistic pictures as well. So we're not simply looking at a whole bunch of triangles and rectangles and circles and projections and trajectories. We are actually looking at forms that for them symbolized uh, spiritual soaring. But this art movement was rather short-lived. It was overwhelmed by the Soviet propaganda art. But here are two examples of uh, the Soviet avant-garde, Russian and Soviet avant-garde. Both of them are from year 1937. Uh, uh, Olga, I'm sorry, uh, Luibov Popova and Olga Rozanova, both oil on canvas. This one is called painterly architectonics. This one is. Uh, non-objective composition, uh, flight of an airplane. The teacher in me always comes back to these compositional structures and in just about every single one of these paintings or sculptures or graphic artworks that we will see, there is a diagonal, a leftward or, or a rightward, but there are these dynamic diagonals that speak of, of movement, of energy, of dynamism. USSR in Construction was a propaganda magazine here published in English. It was published in Russian, of course, English, French, German, and Spanish, and it was distributed all around the world. And it was a revolutionary uh, magazine in the sense that it really experimented with photomontage. And uh, this issue, number 12, is actually devoted, this is a two-page spread, by the way, from that uh, magazine. Uh, it, it celebrates the great achievement, the opening of the White Sea Canal, uh, which was built by Gulag prisoners. In New York, by the way, in Manhattan, in a private gallery, there's an exhibition devoted to this magazine um, alone. If you're interested, I can give you the information on, uh, on that. We have Stalin overlooking the uh, White Sea Canal. Here is a lithograph from year 1920 by Alexander Rochenko, a fine artist. Uh, I'm sorry, this is Alexander Rochenko. The artist here is unknown. Um, the, uh, the poster reads, organization of production equals victory over the capitalist system. But even in this one, we have from the large to the small triangle, we have a very dynamic diagonal uh, taking place. This I'm sure you have seen in the New York Times Magazine or, or any magazine. This is from 1996. It's the Stolichnaya vodka commercial. It's curious that this Russian avant-garde or Soviet avant-garde constructivist or minimalist style comes back. It's, uh, it's in fashion, it's in vogue again, but that diagonal uh, bright colors. It's really a public uh, style, the kind of graphic art style that was developed around there, around that time, uh, comes back in, in a different form. Now, the farm family from Kallenberg is back because now we have the Soviet family. This one is called, it's an oil on canvas from year 1938. It's called the Commandant's Family. Both of these are rather content families. Um, members of this family seem to be more, more submissive. Members of the Soviet family, however, seem to be more interactive. There seems to be more light, more joy, more hope. And especially the women in these two pictures are, are quite different. The mother here is sort of pushed to the side. The, the mother and the dog, if you will, are, are are off, separated from the family. Uh, but there is a positive, positive aspect of that depiction because this clearly is a professional woman. There is a certain independence that is attached to her uh, with, with that depiction, whereas the, the mother in this picture is clearly a part of the family, uh, bearing and, and, and raising children. It's unimaginable to think of this woman uh, going off uh, and, and doing anything else besides housework. Uh, clear differences. Also, the lack of interaction in this one and uh, a, somewhat of an interaction, somewhat of a joyous uh, connection between the members of uh, this family. But again, happy, content families, uh, metaphorically speaking, uh, that stand for a happy,
content and rather submissive society. Lenin? Yes, absolutely. The bust, the bust of, of Lenin. Yes. Right. 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 There is more um, symbolism, political symbolism there. Uh, absolutely. You had to have a Lenin or a Stalin hovering somewhere uh, in, in any of those pictures. Speaking of the family, now we're coming back to the, uh, the German avant-garde, those paintings uh, that were condemned, censored, uh, burned, etc. This is Max Beckman. It's an oil on canvas called The Family Picture. It's a rather early painting. It's from 1920. But as early as 1920, a lot of artists, intellectuals, uh, composers, were aware of what was happening in Germany, and they were uh, alarmed by that. And their, their works, uh, their, their novels, their, their paintings, uh, their music reflected uh, their fear their frustration, their desperation, if you will. This, in a way, is like a, a colorful Guernica. It employs the same expressive style. Uh, German expressionist artists were heavily influenced by tribal art, by African sculptures and, and carvings and, and paintings and so forth. And that, for Hitler's regime, was uh, a very good point of manipulation because he obviously enough, stressed racial and cultural purity. And here, all of a sudden, there was this non-Western, non, totally non-German element seeping into German culture, and in a way, degenerating German culture. Uh, so that connection was made very quickly. As soon as these paintings uh, surfaced, uh, Hitler's regime uh, sort of branded them as degenerate art. And in the year of 1937, they have held the first degenerate art exhibition. An official exhibition opened in Munich first and then traveled throughout Germany, which was uh, featuring works of modern artists like Max Beckman, Picasso, Brock, Chagall, Matisse, by the way, all of those, uh, those dear modern artists, who, all of whom are in Museum of uh, Modern Art in New York. Degenerate art exhibition that went hand in hand with great German art exhibitions that featured the works of official state artists or of artists who have done uh, their work as they have always done it. I mean, he did not change his style to cater to the, to the expectations of the Third Reich. An artist like this one would simply allow uh, the Third Reich to use his paintings for propaganda. Um, oddly enough, Otto Dix, whose works we saw a minute ago, uh, like Flanders or the triumph of that, Otto Dix, along with a lot of other German modernists, supported the, uh, the regime of the Third Reich in the beginning. Uh, for a long time, in fact, until 1938, the annexation of Austria took place. Uh, and that, that event soured up a lot of artists, a lot of intellectuals, but it was a bit too late at that point. Here's a family picture again. And it's clearly a modern picture, and the style matters. Uh, it, it goes beyond taste. This may not be the kind of painting we would purchase for our living rooms, for our bedrooms. However, the, the, uh, the fact that the artist zeroes in a, a very disturbing aspect of family life, of social life, and exposes something about the nature of, uh, of society makes it modern, I believe. There are, uh, again, we can go on forever on this painting, but there are some very, very interesting passages of uh, unimaginable pain. This boy who's reading a, a, a book on the floor in, in candlelight, if you, if you look at the foot and that leg and how, uh, how un unimaginable that, that uh, bending, that stretching is, it's, it's an impossible position, actually. Uh, these figures are loaded with extreme uh, torturous um, pain really. Uh, this is 1936, and by 1936, the reality in Germany was much like this. This is the opening day of the first degenerate art exhibition in Munich. You have Hitler and, and his, uh, his cabinet uh, visiting the show. Max Beckman's paintings were up on the walls, along with Kandinsky. This is a Kandinsky. That's 
hung askew on the wall, by the way, on purpose in, in mockery. And some of the shapes and forms are carried out onto the wall with some surrealist and Dadaist uh, slogans. Uh, Max Beckman uh, was about to leave the country. He was uh, voluntarily uh, leaving Germany, going to London first, and then coming to the United States. Uh, this painting is one of the last uh, from around that time. It's an oil on canvas. It's in the Museum of Modern Art. It's a triptych called The Departure. It's a very enigmatic, <coughs> excuse me, uh, painting. Uh, but I think we can uh, read into certain aspects of it. In the center panel, we have what looks like a royal family, maybe a king and a queen uh, uh, with, with, a, with a little prince. And this figure with that mask-like hat or cap on his on his head uh, <clears throat> may look like a, uh, the, uh, the artist himself. It may be an executioner. This may be a Madonna and child reference, but this is clearly a very serene, very pleasant uh, picture. And the king seems to be blessing as he himself seems to be uh, on the run, as he himself seems to be uh, <clears throat> going away with the catch of the day the two uh, side panels, all of the tortures, the massacres that are taking place on the side panels, uh, is a drummer. So the tortures are taking place to the beat of this drummer, and, and a stark, very stark contrast between the two. Here's a, a shot of that exhibition without Hitler and uh, company. <clears throat> a few years later, Los Angeles uh, Contemporary uh, Museum of Art uh, reconstructed the so-called degenerate art exhibition, uh, giving it <coughs> a little more credibility. When you see it in this form, it looks like the interior of any uh, modern art museum uh, anywhere in the world. And most of the uh, most of the paintings from the original show were included in this one. Uh, when when these exhibitions traveled hand in hand throughout Germany, <coughs> and and came to a point where uh, where they had to get rid of the paintings. Close to 4,000, uh, 3,825 is the number that I remember. Uh, artworks were actually destroyed by burning, and the rest of the lot uh, was sold in Lucerne uh, in an auction. And of course, British dealers, French dealers, and, and some American dealers um, tried, to, tried to get a piece of the action. I mean, here these ma modern masters were being sold off and they tried to get as much of it as <clears throat> possible. I want to show you very quickly a few of those, uh, those artists who were condemned, <clears throat> censored, persecuted, exiled. Kandinsky, an early painting from around 1910, oil on canvas. It's called uh, Landscape near Marnau. Kandinsky again, a much later painting. Um, it is, uh, again, oil on canvas. It's called Non-Objective Composition. Emil Nolde, Oil on Canvas. This is from 1936. It's called The Breaker. Emil Nolde also supported the Nazi regime for a long, long time, and he never understood why his paintings were, were banned. But uh, these people, all of them, had teaching positions, respectable teaching positions, which they have lost, and their livelihoods were, uh, were on the line. Otto Dix, again. Uh, this is called Sunset. Um, it's from, it's a later painting, it's oil on canvas, mounted on wood. Uh, it's a much later painting from 1942. One of my <coughs> favorite artists, Keira Kolwitz, who also had a teaching position, which was, who was forced to resign. Uh, charcoal on paper, it's a self-portrait with pencil. This is a lithograph called Summons of Death. <coughs> Ernst Kirchner. The same fate, who was a professor uh, of art who was fired from his, his job, and he too supported the regime for many, many years. Franzi in front of a carved stool, uh, oil on canvas, a very early painting from 1912. It's one of those tribal carved stools. This one is in the Museum of Modern Art. It's oil on canvas called the street. Again, the African or tribal influence here was one of the things that the Nazis picked up on. 
The fact that some of these artists and intellectuals were Jewish was another point that they were very quick to, to capitalize on. And there was a dilemma, though, because what is called the, the great German Nordic spirit, what is called the German sp uh, Nordic spirit, manifests itself in art in a very expressive way. Uh, the great <coughs> German artist Grunwald, this is the Eisenheim altarpiece. Uh, this is the cover, cover of the altarpiece. As you can see, it's a triptych, actually, that opens up to reveal an inner painting. This is the uh, edge where the two panels come together. It's a crucifixion. It's, it's a religious painting, however, it's, uh, it's, it sort of uh, uh, exaggerates distortions and, in a way, abstractions um, to accentuate pain and suffering. It almost has the same expressive <coughs> or expressionistic quality. Now, Goebbels himself uh, tried to push that point with the Nazis. It didn't work. <coughs> and uh, Goebbels himself, again, uh, would do things like, he would commission Otto Dix, for instance, to paint portraits of his children. Uh, he was probably the most uh, liberal-minded or, or <coughs> um, more refined, culturally, artistically speaking, of, of them all. Uh, but in the end, he lost the battle, even though he favored a more modern uh, art style for the Third Reich. In the end, it wasn't the Nordic spirit that manifested itself in uh, art history, but it was this kind of ridicule of propaganda, negative propaganda, that equated uh, blackness and Jewishness with degenerate culture. Uh, this cartoony illustration is actually the cover of the second degenerate art exhibition in Dusseldorf. It reads degenerate music and I think the, the image speaks uh, for itself. <clears throat> now to the uh, last important work of 1937, as far as we're concerned, Picasso's Guernica. Uh, you're already familiar with the work. I just want to show from the very, very first sketch that he did, like a doodle that he did on a little piece of paper to the very last uh, final product. Uh, the time period is amazing. It took three days over a month to complete the painting from this first initial sketch. This is May 1st, 1937. This is the second more or less complete drawing. Again, a small piece of uh, paper. <coughs> Third one is May 9th. I want to be exact with these dates. This is the first large-scale compositional uh, study, pencil and charcoal on paper. As you can see, the figures are uh, finding their, their place on paper. The first stage of the painting. Now, uh, this was a, a huge studio. The painting itself is uh, 12 feet by 25 feet. You have to imagine 12 by 25. I don't know if you were fortunate enough to see it when it was in the Museum of Modern Art, but if you have, an unforgettable experience. Uh, it's, it was by itself in this huge room. You would walk in, and even if you didn't like the painting, it would take you 25 feet to try to walk away from it. Um, so images, these cartoony uh, images, would stay in your mind, would be embedded in your uh, memory. What is interesting here is that he originally was thinking of an outdoor scene. There is a big sun. It also looks like a, a sunflower. A huge fist holding a bunch of uh, a, a wheat. Uh, grass and, and flowers, roof tiles over there. So there, there are outdoor references, the references to nature, which all pretty much disappeared. <clears throat> this is the second stage that I have, May 13th. The speed with which he, he worked is uh, unbelievable. We're talking about less, less than a month for the painting itself. And this is the final painting, the final stage. June 4th. I'll show you a few of the close-ups. The far left-hand side of the painting, there are many references there. One of the references is to the famous painting by another Spanish artist from early 19th century, 1908-1914, uh, 
called the 3rd of May. It's an oil on canvas. It's a fairly large painting, 8 by 12. It's, it depicts the uh, massacre of Spaniards by uh, the army of Napoleon. But the figure in this white shirt who's being uh, executed, who's being shot, is repeated in Picasso's painting. That's his homage to another uh, Spaniard, as well as a self-portrait. Really kind of looks like him, I think. Uh, moving towards the middle of the painting, we have those uh, mythological, symbolic animals, again, used in this painting, the horse being blown away. Horse is a symbol of uh, elegant power and also tamed power, uh, controllable power. And then the bull over on the other side as a symbol of, of, it could be many things. It could be Spain. It could be General Franco. It could be also read as a brute force, bully, a bull, the bully, uh, uncontrollable, untamable force. There's a bird's nest on the corner of this table and a bare light bulb that also looks like an eyeball witnessing. He is exposing the scene and we are witnessing this massacre along with uh, Picasso. So these, these, again, cartoony simplifications and, and distortions in real life in the museum would be about this big in front of you and the effect was not comical at all. It was very, very powerful uh, these are the true colors of the painting, pretty much black and white and different shades and tones of gray, sort of like a newspaper photograph. In fact, he, he did try to duplicate the newsprint with some of these uh, pointless brush strokes as well. So this is his uh, reportage, uh, this is his um, announcement, if you will, of a disaster. Now, I think we could use a little bit of serenity after Picasso's Guernica. This is the famous house of Frank Lloyd Wright in Bear Run, Pennsylvania, the most famous house probably. What is remarkable is that this house is from 1936. Uh, so it looks like a 1970s, 80s villa from Palm Beach or, or wherever. 1936, a house with no roof, a house which was so dynamic in its design was unbelievable. In fact, uh, the local um, uh, engineers and, and experts said that it couldn't be built. You can't build a house into a rock. It'll ruin the landscape, the house will collapse. Um, he built it anyway, and it's one of the marvelous examples of modern architecture. I'm coming back to this house for a very specific reason. Well, first of all, it's very close to uh, 1937. But secondly, something about the visual language. I just wanted to show a few examples of architecture and also some beautiful slides. Uh, it, it includes nature. Nature is not just like a backyard or a front yard or a side yard around the house, but it comes into the design. In fact, that was one of the requirements of the Kaufman family. Uh, when they commissioned the house, they said, well, this was a retreat, a little cottage, if you will, for them. Uh, they said, we want to feel uh, nature. We want to feel wilderness wherever we are in the house. And we want to hear the sound of the waterfall wherever we are in the house. So he did that. He made these balconies and terraces projecting into space in such exciting, dynamic uh, ways. And there are no columns, no supports underneath any one of those. That's why it looks so exciting. Um, you know, with a few columns, it would have been a lot cheaper, actually, uh, less time consuming, but a very lazy, boring design, probably, because it would be very um, predictable. I would like to keep this and come back to, my, uh, to the point that I would like to make uh, and contrast them with some of the official state uh, architectural examples. This is, of course, Spears Tower. Uh, order exists in both of them. But here, I would like to... Uh, put the focus on parts of this design. Different parts of the same design are unified, are harmonized as they have to be, but the parts seem to be identical. And maybe some other slides will make it clearer. Uh, this is a model for the entrance tower of the National Socialist Workers Party building. the great German stadium, model for it by Albert Speer. And the model 
for the building of the Institute of War Technology Berlin. I'd especially like to keep this one here. Speaking of different parts of a design, uh, speaking of symmetrical balance, and then looking at Frank Lloyd's piece and seeing that every single part has its own character, has its own individuality. I will go as far as saying this is a good example of uh, uh, a marriage of differences, a marriage of contrasts. I don't know how far one can take architectural design and, and sort of uh, project something about society. But uh, I think I will today. He uses different materials, organic materials like the, the uh, pieces of stone that were car uh, cut in, from a nearby uh, quarry, the exact same stone at the foundation. So the vertical parts of the house seem like they're growing naturally from this, this uh, foundation. And then uh, the horizontal parts are painted, pressurized, uh, reinforced concrete. So clearly a geometric, abstract, uh, man-made form projecting in different ways. Each part is different. Each part it has its own character, has its own uniqueness, yet in a very dynamic and energetic way it holds together. There is order. Uh, whereas in, in most of these designs there is um, symmetry in a way uh, that seems almost uh, too predictable, too imposing. Again, unified uh, parts speaking the same uh, language. This might be a good contrast. I'm uh, going to end up here with the, uh, with the next uh, few architectural styles. I think this is a nice contrast. Uh, Museum of Modern Art Building in New York was actually modeled after Walter Gropius's design for the Bauhaus building in Germany. The so-called modern international style in architecture also originated in Germany, but by the year 1930, it was uh, pretty much put out of existence. The, the um, faculty members were fired. Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, uh, along with others, came to the United States and they, they started teaching. Uh, uh, Gropius was teaching at Harvard, uh, actually, for, for many years in, in Massachusetts. Again, there is harmony, there is compositional order and unity. Yet every part speaks uh, of, of a little different language. They do hold together, however. And here is a ground shot of the Bauhaus building. Bauhaus was an, was an incredible dream. It was a dream of, uh, of all architects, artists, sculptors. The dream was to bring all arts together. Architecture, painting, sculpture, furniture design, crafts, graphic design, and produce art for society. Uh, but it was too idealistic. This slide probably will give us a better idea of, of where the Museum of Modern Art Building reference is. And I would like to end with a contemporary piece, just for the heck of it, uh, Philip Johnson's former AT&T Tower in Manhattan. Now it's rented to Sony Corporation, as you know. Uh, when postmodern architectural design appeared, uh, in major cities all around the world. It was celebrated because it was all of a sudden uh, coming out of this uh, geometric purity of modern design and bringing, I don't know, uh, chip and tail tops and Roman ceremonial arches and so forth, entertaining and, and, and joyous. But at the same time, it is, it is kind of reminiscent of all of those historical references, foreboding facades, especially street levels, where we as individuals, especially in a town like Manhattan, a town like Manhattan, uh, where we as individuals relate to the building. We don't really relate to the upper floors, but this is where we relate to the building. And the foreboding facades, the first 10 stories are really pink granite and, and totally foreboding, uh, brings to mind maybe the wrong, uh, wrong associations. This is built for the power of the corporation, clearly. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Philip Johnson had uh, you know, in mind the, the art of the Third Reich, not at all. But whether he intended it or not, uh, the visual language of his design, I think, needs to be looked at more carefully. Uh, this is the 
uh, street level, which was almost unanimously accepted as the most unsuccessful street level uh, ever built in Manhattan. It was disastrous. Um, it didn't work, and I think now it's closed off and turned into uh, a Sony display store of, of uh, some, some sort. And in the lobby, of course, was this statue called uh, Genius of Electricity, which uh, I'm not going to push the point too far, but this is Boris Yofan's proposal for the palace of the Soviets. It's a huge building topped with an incredibly uh, big Lenin statue. If you, if you see the Red Army troops marching, gives an idea of size and scale, which wasn't actualized. It was too big a proposal. But uh, similarities, I think, are at least to be thought about. I will not say anything about these two slides. I will simply leave you with them. This is the Empire State Government Plaza in Albany, New York. And the art critic Robert Hughes, who writes for the Time magazine, uh, in his book, Shock of the New, labeled this complex of buildings as uh, clearly as an example of uh, authoritarian architecture. He even used the term fascist, fascist architecture. I lived in Albany for many years, and I, I couldn't help agree with him. Um, so I will leave you with these, and thank you very much for your attendance. We're going to see another example of Kevin Cook's uh, mastery of, uh, of <laughs> all the light, light switches, and thank him for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's for you, Kevin. Um, I know I kept you a little longer than I intended to, but if there are any questions and comments, I would uh, gladly welcome them. Yes. Right, right. I didn't want to go uh, too heavy on Hitler images. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, that's that's true. Uh, by the way, this this subject, the art of the Third Reich, uh, has been, especially of the Third Reich, has been a, a taboo. Uh, in New York, there is an armory building where uh, the the U.S. troops, as they uh, came back from Germany at the end of the World World War Two, came back with a with a whole lot of uh, artworks, swastikas, shields, eagles, uh, sculptures, paintings, uh, thousands and thousands of them. And they, ever since, they, they tried to give them back to Germany. And the Germans don't want to take them. <laughs> and also German art museums, the basements of museums, are full of examples of uh, the Third, Re uh, Third Reich art. But they're pretty much kept in basements for obvious reasons. Recently, there has been a number of exhibitions uh, featuring the art of the Third Reich, a very, very successful ones. Each time, it's a controversy. A month ago, uh, there was an article in uh, New York Times, New York Times, actually. There's a traveling exhibition in Europe that uh, concentrates on authoritarian art of, of Europe, Mussolini, uh, Hitler, Stalin, etc. cetera. Uh, it's not coming to the United States, but it's those pieces are coming out into the open more and more. I think it's important. Someone said that what is scary about uh, the, uh, the art of the Third Reich is not the fascist overtones, but the normality of them all. Uh, a lot of them look so normal. I think architecture is a good example uh, in that respect, because we sometimes we take things a little too easily. We accept them a little too easily. Um, yes. I didn't read that, um, but uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, these uh, one other example is uh, when they had the degenerate art exhibitions. They hung uh, price tags from each modern painting showing how much of taxpayers' money was used by German museums to purchase this, this degenerate 
art. And I, I mentioned that last Tuesday during the lecture, and one of my colleagues, Tim Gustafson, after the lecture said, well, uh, that brought to mind uh, Jesse Helms' crusade on uh, censorship in the arts and taxpayers' money, that connection. Uh, there are connections, but who uses those connections for to what end is, is very interesting to, uh, to think about. Yes? I thought it was very interesting when you showed the picture of um, the, the, the anti-Semitism against the Jews and how that connected to the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was very surprised to see that because, I mean, I didn't know about the African tribal influence. And, and uh, I just wonder, uh, is that something that the, uh, uh, the Nazi regime continued? Uh, because, I mean, they had the Holocaust, but they intentionally tried to destroy right. the Jews. Anti, yes, I would say anti, uh, I'm Turkish, and uh, you know, I would have no chance in, in Germany at that time uh, at all. Uh, gypsies, Turks, Greeks, uh, anything and everything that they thought was quote unquote impure non German. Uh, but then again, it is how they used that concept for their own uh, purposes, to validate their own you know, political regime. Um, I mean, you know, one of the things, um, as, as these artists, since we're talking about art, were being persecuted and uh, artworks were being burned and, and destroyed, Goebbels himself, for instance, reserved 14 of the best examples of modern art, clearly influenced from tribal art, from African carvings. Uh, the artist, Jewish or not, did not matter a bit. Uh, so there it is. There's a paradox. There's one German artist, for instance, who exhibited in both exhibitions at the same time. One work, which was a little more representational. It was a, a, a depiction of, it was a sculpture of the famous German boxer, Max Schlemming, I think. Schmeling. I knew I was, yeah, I was going off the, it was close, close enough. Uh, that was in the, you know, exhibited in the uh, great German art exhibition. And another more cubist sculpture was exhibited at the same time across the street in the degenerate art exhibition. So they, they draw home the, that point of racial purity. But uh, you know, it, they could have been, it could have been manipulated, and it was manipulated uh, in any, any way uh, to fit their current agenda, really. Uh, yes? It's very interesting. Uh, another point. Um, we're thinking of these degenerate art exhibitions uh, as, as something that was particular to the art of, uh, to, to the Third Reich regime. In 1906, the Kaiser himself banned all impressionist paintings from all German museums. This is 1906. Uh, so it's something to think about. Uh, somebody gave three Van Gogh paintings to, to German museums as gifts, and he was so alarmed that he, he banned all impressionist uh, modern artworks from, uh, from. So it's, uh, yeah. Um, from your reading, is this degenerate art that is that the people saw? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. In fact, uh, millions more visited the degenerate art exhibition than uh, they did the, the uh, great German art. Because if you saw great German art uh, you know, once or twice, the rest was pretty much the same. And it was in the media, it was in journals and newspapers everywhere. Whereas the degenerate art stuff was interesting. It was exciting, it was uh, forbidden. 
it was controversial. Many, many people actually went there as almost as an homage uh, because these artists, I mean, they really supported that. And, and others simply went to see uh, what, was, what was going on. But it was much better attended than the great German art exhibitions. Yes. In the third, uh, he's, he's been around for a long time. I don't know when he started showing. Uh, in the 30s, it be he, he became, uh, you know, one of the f uh, controversial artists. So his works were picked for degenerate art exhibitions. But the ones that we have seen are from the 30s, and he kept on painting through the 40s also. Um, I would say 30s. But he's been painting since 1910. I mean, I, as far as I mean, the paintings that I know are go back to 19, the early 1900s. Uh, because in, I mean, if you imagine that he had a, a prestigious teaching position in the 30s, he must have been around exhibiting a painting for a long time. Oh, in New York, I see. Yes, well, it, it, that's right, after the war, after the war. Uh, again, there are some famous Manhattan art dealers. You hear the names. Uh, it was amazing. As I was reading and, and reading, I realized these famous art dealers were around. They were trying to get from the Nazis the, the, the degenerate artworks that they were trying to get rid of. They were going to Switzerland and London, and dealers were competing with each other to get a piece of the action. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting to to see that side of the story, uh, the dynamics of the market as well. Um, well, thank you very much. Hope to see you again. I just want to echo uh, Sir Dar's thanks, and our thanks to you also. This is the second time I heard the lecture. I, I learned this. I, you don't do it the same every time. I, I don't. <laughs> it's, your, it's your introduction that uh, yeah, gets yeah, me going. <laughs> anyway, I invite you to return. Uh, certainly, to record all sorts of this art gallery uh, uh, shows uh, seven to between seven and ten shows each year. This is the last outside show, and then beginning this weekend, we'll have a month of student work. Um, and the art gallery is open at every hour, but that the library is open. We'll know those types of posted upstairs. Certainly, to our books and coffee program, to our music uh, concert and recital series, you are most welcome. On the back table, there is a brochure, the Concordia Gallery, and I invite you to pick this up. This is this is the brochure for the year that is ending. So this is not, I ask you to take this not so much as an invitation, uh, but, all, but simply to review the scope of what we've offered this year and to look forward to next year. On the, on the uh, one panel, at the bottom of the inside panel, it says the gallery thanks. We have a small but growing number of friends of the gallery, people who believe that this kind of program, both the Art on the Walls and also the, the lecture series, is important. And if you are interested in becoming a friend of the gallery through your financial I would be happy to talk with you, so would Sir Dar. But take that home, and then, and also there is a mailing list. We'd like to have you back next year for all of the lectures and the shows. Thanks so much. Thank you.